Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast. Episode number 47, William Thompson, Evaluating Negative Forensic Evidence. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Bill Thompson. Bill is professor of criminology, law, and society at the University of California, Irvine. Bill's research focuses on forensic science and more broadly expert evidence, as well as human judgment and decision making. Our podcast today features Bill's new article, Evaluating Negative Forensic Evidence, When Do Jurors Treat Absence of Evidence as Evidence of Absence? It was recently published in the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies and was co-authored with Nicholas Skurich, Rachel Diosovia, and Brenda Velasquez. In the article, Bill looks at how juries handle negative evidence, or the absence of evidence that one might otherwise expect to find. For example, you might expect to find gunshot residue on a shooter's hands. What do you do when you test a suspect's hands and find no gunshot residue? What do you do with that information? As Bill describes in the interview, what weight you give to negative evidence should depend on something called the probability of detection, or sensitivity as statisticians call it. That's the probability of getting a positive gunshot residue result when a person actually fired a gun. The problem is, do jurors know what to do with information about the probability of detection? Bill investigates. Bill, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Your article deals with negative evidence. Tell us exactly what you mean by negative evidence and how it's different from the other kinds of evidence that a jury might consider. Well, what we mean by negative evidence is a circumstance where investigators look for something and fail to find it. It might be evidence of the absence of something. If there's an allegation that somebody has been drugged or was using drugs and you test for the drug and don't find it, that's negative evidence on the proposition that the person consumed drugs. If there's an allegation somebody fired a gun and you look for gunshot residue and don't find it, that's negative evidence. We focus specifically on circumstances where there's an effort to find evidence that doesn't succeed, as opposed to circumstances where nobody ever looks, which we call missing evidence. Okay. And what drew you to this particular category of evidence? What are the kinds of problems that we might worry about with juries considering negative evidence as opposed to positive evidence? As you probably know, I do a lot of work with forensic scientists, and I was noticing a lot of confusion among forensic scientists about the value of negative evidence. And it occurred to me that there might also be confusion among jurors and among lawyers even about how they understand this evidence. A lot of it revolves around this aphorism, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. So forensic scientists are often claim that their failure to find something is not probative of the absence of that thing. Looking at the matter from a logical framework, particularly thinking about it in terms of Bayesian decision making, it's clear that absence of evidence sometimes is evidence of absence. Your failure to detect something that you should have been able to detect if it was there is probative of the proposition that it's in fact absent or should be if interpreted properly. I was sensing a lot of confusion about this in the way that experts talked about it, and I wanted to get more information about how lay people might respond to it. So there's that piece about deductive and inductive reasoning that you bring up in the article, which is that deductively, the absence of evidence does not necessarily mean evidence of absence. But on the other hand, from an inductive perspective or from a Bayesian perspective, the absence of evidence does suggest something. It's a probabilistic thing. It gives you some information, but it's not necessarily a slam dunk. Yeah. I think some of the confusion about the value of this evidence comes from things we teach undergraduates about hypothesis testing in social science. 
social science students are always told that you cannot confirm a null hypothesis. You can reject a null hypothesis, but if you fail to detect evidence that would reject your null hypothesis, that does not prove that the null hypothesis is true because there might be many other reasons that you would fail to find that evidence. This is kind of consistent with the aphorism that absence of evidence shouldn't be taken as evidence of the absence of something. However, in the context of criminal or civil trial, the jury's not trying to definitively establish one hypothesis over another. The jury's trying to decide which of two alternative propositions is more likely to be true. In that circumstance, the more probabilistic or inductive kind of inferences are very important. And just to follow up on that, even on the null hypothesis piece, the acceptance of the null hypothesis can still be evidence that the null hypothesis is correct if your test is sufficiently powerful and you would expect that it would reject in certain cases. Yes. The aphorism is true because if you have a no power test, then accepting the null hypothesis means nothing. But if you have actually a high power test, you actually get something out of it. Yeah. Forensic scientists are sort of schizophrenic about this because on the one hand, there's this well-known principle or supposed principle in forensic science called Locard's rule or Locard's principle that every contact leaves a trace, which is cited as one of the fundamental principles. But if every contact leaves a trace and you don't detect the trace, that should tell you that there's no contact. But forensic scientists generally won't go there, right? So the Locard principle in practice seems to be every contact leaves a trace unless it doesn't. <laughs> And, uh, and, and we'll decide when it should or not. <laughs> so. One of the keys to your article is this idea of contextual information. So you have the absence of evidence, and you're trying to figure out how to interpret this absence of evidence given the context. I just wanted to poke you a little bit on this. Presumably, you always need this kind of contextual information, you know, sensitivity or specificity, when you're evaluating any kind of evidence, whether it's positive or negative. Is there any particular reason to think that negative evidence poses greater difficulty for juries in this way, that they can't deal with the contextual information in the same way or with the same expertise as positive evidence? Well, that was exactly what we were trying to find out when we conducted the studies. Nobody had actually studied human inferences involving negative evidence, at least not in a context where the conditional probabilities of detecting the evidence were made clear. We were curious to see whether people's intuitive judgments about the absence of evidence would, in effect, track along with Bayesian norms, or whether we would see deviations in human judgment from Bayesian norms, which could potentially tell us something interesting about people's thought process. The basic strategy is similar to what Kahneman and Tversky <laughs> did with their research. It's just, it's just, a, it's just applied in, a, in this negative domain. So let's talk about those experiments. Without going into a lot of detail, how did you conduct this experiment? And basically, how did you go about asking your question? Well, we wanted a factual scenario in which the probability of detection for the sought item, information would be provided about that key variable, the probability of detection. It's a jury simulation kind of paradigm where people are asked to evaluate evidence in a hypothetical case and give their assessment of the strength of evidence and likelihood of guilt of the accused. How we made the probability of detection clear was we used as the evidence gunshot residue, and we told people that the forensic laboratory that had looked for a gunshot residue on the hands and clothing of a suspected shooter in a crime and hadn't found it, and that they were interested to know how likely it would be that they would fail to find it under those circumstances. So they'd actually done an experiment in which they had a number of people fire the gun in question, go through the actions that the suspect would have gone through, and then they tested empirically what the probability of detection was. And then we gave them a value for the probability of detection, which we could experimentally vary to see how much weight they gave to the failure to detect with varying levels of the detection probability. Okay, so that's the setup. When you ran the experiment where they are given the scenario and this information about the probability of detection, what kind of results did you get from your jurors? We ran two experiments. The first was with classic subject population undergraduates. The second, we used people we'd recruited from a local jury pool, actual jurors. In the context of the experiment, this negative evidence supported the defendant's claim of innocence. 
he was accused of a crime that involved firing a gun. No gunshot residue was detected on him. And so this supported innocence. But we varied the probability of detection. In the first experiment, the values of probability of detection were either zero or 50% or 100%. If there's 100% probability of detection and it's not detected, that should be very strong evidence of its absence. And so we expected with a 100% condition that people would be much less likely to convict than in the 0% condition. And, and that is, in fact, what we found. So it did look like people appreciated the importance of the probability of detection, at least when comparing zero versus 100% probability. What was kind of interesting is, is the 50% probability condition, which was treated as not significantly different than the 0% condition. 50% probability of detection, detection is not certain, but that is still evidence that's probative of innocence, but it wasn't clear from the first experiment whether people treated it as such. That then raised concerns that people might not appreciate the value of negative evidence when the probability of detection was less than certain. Let me stop you there for one minute. What you have found in this first experiment with the undergraduates is that certainly they appreciate the probability of detection, but really in a very on-off way. 100% and 0% are easy ways of thinking about things. Well, you never detect it, which means that your test is useless. Or you always detect it, which means that the test is actually very, very probative. Right. And then you see that with the 50%, when you start messing with probabilities and make it uncertain, they don't do very well. Right. Conceptually, the 50% condition should have half the probative value of the 100% condition. And we found people gave a little less weight to 50%, but not significantly less weight. It raised concerns about whether people's judgments in this domain are adequately calibrated, whether people are giving adequate weight to evidence of non-detection when the probability of detection is less than certain. It's an important issue because it comes up all the time, like in testing for drugs and testing for gunshot residue and testing for petroleum products after arson and so on. There are, there are many circumstances where you can do forensic testing, which has a chance of detecting something, but the probability of detection is less than certain. The concern is that people may have difficulty appreciating the value of such evidence. Now, that's the first experiment. And then you did a follow-up study using an actual jury pool where you changed those probability of detections. You made it a little bit finer in terms of your experimental conditions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. The second experiment was partly just to replicate the first findings with a different subject pool with actual jurors to see if that would replicate. But we also threw in some additional conditions to see if there might be threshold effects. So the initial experiment was just 0%, 50%, and 100%. The second experiment, we had 0%, 50%, 60%, 90%, and 100%. We wanted to see if there might be a certain threshold that needed to be passed before people would start giving weight to negative evidence. And what did you get there? It was kind of interesting. Uh, once again, people gave a lot of weight to the 100% evidence relative to the 0% evidence. So people were distinguishing between 0 and 100%. But with regard to 50%, 60%, and 90%, those were all treated as more or less equivalent and kind of moderate in strength between the two. It's as if people had kind of a crude metric for dealing with the negative evidence. If they were told the 100% chance of detection, they gave it a lot of weight, 0% chance of detection, little weight. Anything that was less than 100%, whether it was 50, 60, or 90, was all treated more or less the same and intermediate. And so it suggests that people are discounting the evidence when the probability of detection is less than certain, but not in a way that seems well calibrated to the actual probative value of the evidence. And those results are a little different from the first one, because you said that in the first one, the 50% was much closer to zero, whereas in your second experiment, all of these intermediate ones basically establish a mid-range, a discounted probative value. Is that right? Yeah, what you just said is true with regard to the verdicts, percentage of voting guilty. With regard to estimates of the strength of the evidence, there was still not a significant difference between zero and 50%. With regard to 50%, there's kind of mixed evidence, but it did look like we had some evidence that 50% was treated as different than 0% in the second experiment.
And it maybe we could have found it in the first experiment too, had we run more subjects. It may just have been a, a lack of sensitivity in our design. This question may be a bit premature, but what implications do these results have for the legal system? Logic tells us that the probability of detection is really important information. And jurors, at least at a crude level, seem to process it correctly. So yes, the intermediate range gets lumped together, but they are able to separate zero from the intermediate range from 100%. Does it mean that probability of detection should be a requirement before this kind of negative evidence is found to be admissible? I certainly think so. Because if you think about it, if you don't know the probability of detection, then the value of the negative evidence is impossible to evaluate, right? If the probability of detection is zero, then the evidence is worthless. If its probability is 100%, it may be very powerful. If the probability of detection is somewhere in between, its value will be somewhere in between. But if the jury wasn't given information about the probability of detection, then I don't see how they can make sense of the failure to detect. And I think it could be prejudicial. If I were on the jury and somebody told me we tested for drugs and we didn't find them, I would certainly take that as evidence against the theory the person had used drugs, because why would they be telling me about it if it wasn't probative? If the experts can't give the jury at least some sense of what the probability of detection would be, that the value of the evidence is speculative and judges should consider excluding it. There's also a danger of prejudice that comes from the juries being exposed to glib arguments about absence of evidence not being evidence of absence. One of the things that got me interested in this work was some publications by other researchers on negative evidence. Particularly, Regina Schuler did some interesting studies looking at how people respond to evidence of the failure to detect a date rape drug. She found if you just present to the jury the fact that the lab tested for a date rape drug in the complainant's blood and found no evidence of it, that that was very persuasive. But if the expert says, oh, but you should consider that this test won't always detect the date rape drug, absence of evidence, don't assume that means proves absence then people gave zero weight to the evidence of the undetected date rape drug. Now, what was interesting, I thought about Schuler's studies, is that whether her findings are a good thing or a bad thing actually depend on what we know or think we know about the probability of detection. If the probability of detection was very low, then the expert testimony that negates the value of the negative result is helpful and leads the jury to the correct conclusion. But if the probability of detection was substantial, it may be that this kind of testimony was persuading the jury to disregard evidence that they should have taken into account. And so I think, you know, in terms of legal policy and in terms of guidance to trial judges in making these decisions, I think that the trial judge needs to think carefully and thoughtfully about what is known about probability detection and whether in light of that the evidence should even be admissible. This is a really fascinating and interesting point. So what you have here is, I would say most of the time we don't actually have really good quantitative data on the probability of detection. Yes. That's already a problem. So then the question is, what's the best response? And what you're suggesting is, if you tell the jury just in general terms, that there may be a problem with the detection probabilities, the jury will almost immediately weight it to zero. If you don't tell the jury anything, they're going to weight it very highly. And you really perhaps don't want either one. It really depends on what the answer is or what the actual probability of detection is. So I guess this suggests your solution, which is that really, in order for you to admit it, you have to actually provide some kind of probability of detection, even though that may mean excluding a lot of evidence until people come up with this kind of information. My personal feeling is that it, it's not necessary that an expert be able to quantify it, but the experts might have enough experience that they can give some sense of whether for a test under these circumstances you almost always fail to detect or only occasionally fail to detect or half and half. But if the expert can't at least give a rough approximation, then I don't see how the jury can evaluate the evidence and there's a danger of either over or underweighting it. Final question for you. What's next? 
What work remains to be done in this area, either by you or by others? I'm chairing a human factors committee of this NIST-sponsored organization called OSAC, which is developing standards for forensic scientists. So we're giving a lot of thought and we're talking to the forensic science community about what forensic scientists should be doing. So we are encouraging them to do more background research on probability of detection issues and to be more careful about testimony. That's starting. In terms of empirical studies of juries' reactions, I think there's room for all kinds of additional I'm not sure I'm going to be the person to do it, given that I have other interests as well. But I think that the question of how well these findings generalize and the best way to talk to juries or explain to juries these findings is pretty interesting. There may be room here for expert testimony regarding these negative inferences. It's clear that people have some difficulty with them. So there might be justification. This is always controversial. The idea of having an expert tell the jury how to think about evidence is always a controversial notion. But this could conceivably be one of those areas where it would make sense to allow an expert to talk with the jury about the logic of inferences from negative findings so that they didn't either give it zero weight or lots of weight so that they could have a better understanding of it. Whether that kind of testimony would be helpful or not or understood or not is another empirical question on which we have no data. So I think there's a lot of room to explore this issue further. Well, Bill, thanks for taking the time to talk about this important issue of negative evidence and how juries interpret it. Great having you on the show. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. As I reflected on the results of Bill's study, I started to realize that the conclusions we can draw from it are actually quite grim. Yes, jurors do in fact account for the probability of detection in assessing the weight of negative evidence. If a test has 0% probability of detection, then jurors discount it. If a test has 100% probability, then jurors give it significant weight. But then again, this result is arguably damning with faint praise. After all, those extremes seem kind of obvious. If the test is completely worthless, meaning it has a 0% probability of detection, one would hope that the jury would not discount the results. If the test is perfect, the 100% probability of detection, then one would hope that the jury would give it a lot of weight. What's really important in this context is what a juror does with intermediate values of the probability of detection. And here, things are not that great. Even in the second experiment, where jurors appropriately attributed medium weight to the evidence, they don't really distinguish between different probabilities of detection. 50%, 60%, and 90% are all basically the same thing to the subjects. Perhaps it's not a disaster because they give it medium weight, but it's not exactly fantastic since the jurors aren't distinguishing between what really are quite important differences in the power of the tests. Even more tricky are these previous results that Bill discussed, suggesting that in the absence of quantitative probabilities, the weight that a juror gives to a test result can vary wildly depending on how things are framed. If you say nothing, the juror actually gives the negative evidence significant weight. If you warn the juror about false negatives, the juror may dismiss the evidence entirely. I don't disagree with Bill's policy conclusions. Yes, we should encourage more quantitative studies of the probability of detection. And yes, when we lack quantitative probabilities, experts should give some sense of what they might be. But getting jurors to appropriately weight this information remains a significant uphill battle, which is of course a real problem if we want jurors to get things right the juror may dismiss the evidence entirely. I don't disagree with Bill's policy conclusions. Yes, we should encourage more quantitative studies of the probability of detection. And yes, when we lack quantitative probabilities, experts should give some sense of what they might be. But getting jurors to appropriately weight this information remains a significant uphill battle, which is of course a real problem if we want jurors to get things right.
That does it for this episode of Excited Utterance. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the Vanderbilt Institute for Digital Learning. The associate producers are Alex Nunn and Margot Wilkinson-Smith, and the production editor is Carson Smith. Additional production assistance is provided by Aaron Parr Carranza, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join me again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. Thank you.